Now, I basically pass the mic to Just Choi, uh, member of MIT Europe, one of the consortium mem uh, members of Creatures, and one of the most important uh, persons of this journey, which has been the Creatures Festival. So, Just, all yours. As you are. Okay, here we go. Last night of the festival. So, there was a secret that was just announced, but we have another secret we'd like to announce. Are you ready? No? All right, the secret is, it's a big one. We have Jose Luis de Vicente here with us, and it's a real one. It's a real one. Jose Luis seems to be everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, across this multiverse that's so big and so complex, even more so than the one that was portrayed in an excellent, excellent recent film with the same title. Please go see it. But the multiverse that Jose Luis occupies evolves with changing uh, matters of concern of technological, social, and ecological transformation, including, per but perhaps very importantly and especially, those matters that people find really difficult or uncomfortable to engage with. Jose Luis uh, goes by a curator and cultural researcher most often, for Sona Plus D and many others. But looking at what they do, actually, they can easily be a magician. No? Magician? But also a storyteller for sure. And a shapeshifter, I think. So, with that, um, today, Jose Luis is going to talk about pigeons. What do you think? Yeah. These wonderful creatures who welcomed us or, or not, but graciously allowed us to occupy this space for the past three days. Thank you, pigeons. And I'm sure they're as pleased and feeling lucky as we are to have this magical storyteller as the last keynote speaker for the first Creatures Festival in Sevilla. So please join me in welcoming Jose Luis de Vicente. Muchas gracias, yes. Muchas gracias, ya. Todos por estar aquí esta tarde. Here today and for having invited me to come, I have to say a lot of thanks to many different people, and I also have to apologize. My most sincere apologies to those of you for whose Spanish is not your native language. I would love to be able to do this talk first in English and then in Spanish, or first in Spanish and then in English, but they didn't let me because they thought that we have to finish. It's Friday and you have been here for many days, so I guess you all want to go home at some point or to drink. So I'll try to speak slow, which is not super easy for me. I'm trying to get better and help the translator uh, behind. And, and I want to give a big round of applause for the translator who's going to help me convey in this. And try to, to tell you a few things and a few stories. I am, yeah, I'm, I'm switching now to, to Spanish. Estoy muy contento de venir aquí, que es que siempre venir a casa uh, y ver también las cosas nuevas que, que pasan aquí. Here, this creature project uh, is a perfect example of one of the, of the interests 
that uh, curators and researchers like myself have been exploring over the years. And it is impressive to see it in such a venue. I was remembering this sentence of James Jacob, uh, who said that new ideas need ancient um, buildings. And I think this is a clear example of how such a venue can generate new ways to relate to each other. And I am also very thankful to Themos 98, one of the partners of um, creatures. I have admired them for many years. They have been my friends. And this is not the first time that they allow me to come here to try new, new, new ideas. Whenever I'm not very sure about my ideas, I can commit mistakes. I can risk with things that have, I have not tested much. I have many things in my head that I'm trying to get to understand. And when I told them that I wanted to speak about pigeons, they said, let's go. So it is not a very clear idea in first place, but uh, before that, that, we are in the first stage of this project. They also want me to speak about other works that I completed and that can show you what I have been doing over the past years in a space that I deem represents emerging cultural activity. It is active research about artistic technology, social and scientific aspects. And it shapes new ways to represent and to speak about the different over crisis in our time. I have spoken, I have worked in cultural research I do not like to speak about it like curating or management, but about research, about creating prototypes and systems and narratives that help us to look at the spaces in our world, to see the tension between the political and social systems and cultural and economic systems with the tools we have. And I hope I am able to show you some of these examples and that I can think aloud. And then I will speak to about pigeons. One of my main interests now is how we understand space and time, how we measure in this a moment when we find things happen in milliseconds and in geological area, we have actions that have a long impact. We are coexisting with accelerating technologies that change the notion of time. How do we adjust our senses and our capacity to understand the reality through different strategies and words. This is one of my most recent projects. I inaugurated it one month ago. And it is not a very common project. It started at the beginning of the pandemic, at the beginning of 2020. And it is very linked to a moment in time and space. This is the most visible building in, in the landscape of Barcelona. It is a glorious tower. And this tower is located in Glorious Square, which is the geometrical center of the city, as Idelfon Sarda imagined it. In the 19th century, he invented the modern uh, notion of Barcelona, and also he in created the science of cities, of modern cities, and Sardá proposed that Gloria Square was going to be the center of the city. The main three avenues of the city merged there, and it was aimed to generate a new sense of the city. It was a medieval city with walls, but it had to expand. But over 150 years, the story of Glorious Square is the story of a failure because it never became this center. It was first an exchange station for trains, and there was no city there. And in the 50s, it turned into a symbol of the domination of cars in cities. 
It was supposed to be a privileged place in Barcelona, and then and it became a place of exchange of traffic without any role for the people. And then they also built a deposit of cars with all the the cars which are taken by by the crane, are, by the load truck, are taken there. But then it disappeared, and now it is different. We have this urban garden, and this space has been transformed into uh, another different city. It is a symbol. It is a way to read how our cities have to change over the next 30 years. We have to undergo really um, strong changes if we want to meet our commitments uh, for next generations. I my project was to take that building and to create a viewpoint on the last floor and to connect it with a view of the city. And there was this space, Glorious Square, in the center of Barcelona, which is undergoing a change from uh, being a city for cars to uh, turning into nature. But at the same time, uh, it is a permanent installation looking at the next 10 years, at the next decade. And this decade that we started in 2020 is not just any decade. 2030 is the end of the SDGs by the United Nations that aims to achieve a series of, of systemic changes in our lifestyles and to achieve social justice, sustainability, and climate justice for a different world. And 2030 is the first stop for the commitments of the main uh, of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is our main plan, it's our only plan against the climate breakdown. And in 2030, we should be emitting 50% of CO2 in comparison to the level of 1990. It is an intermediate stop in the way. In 2050, in the Euro European Union, we should have zero emissions. You can imagine that this transformation is huge. So the project was dealing with how to look at these parameters from this present point. We need to understand that here and now in the city, how we can extend and spread the margin of this here and now. Because this here is not only about what you see with your eyes, and this now is not just, uh, it, it, it is also about the city being a changing entity that we will give to the people of the next generations. And it has to change due to the urgent needs to meet these commitments. The project is called uh, Mira, uh, Torre Gloria uh, Viewpoint. On the 31st floor, there is a viewpoint with a sculpture of Tomás Sarraceno. You can see the city, but also the atmosphere around the air and the space around. Because when you're in a viewpoint, you do not only see the city, you are also surrounded by the atmosphere, which is the main front, uh, front of the battle against climate change. And in this, view, this viewpoint, when you go into the viewpoint and see the city from the top, you are not really seeing the city. You are seeing a picture, a moment of, uh, of the city. You are seeing its material, its bricks and cement. You can see the climate, the flow of the cars. But we know that there are many things that are the determining factors for our life 
life in the world which are not visible at first sight. And each city is a series of systems of material and immaterial systems. And a city like Barcelona, uh, and winds are very important in Barcelona with all the suspended particles that are emitted by cars and heatings, and it affects our breathing. There is also the pollen of the trees and the electromagnetic waves con, uh, related to our smartphones. And that enable us to communicate over this very present moment. So we wanted to think about a viewpoint to look at a city with all the, these different systems and to understand the city at all levels. We worked on this project for three years with different studies and with different artists in the, of the world. This is one of the pieces that you can see in the uh, in the viewpoint, it is atmosphere. It is an observatory that allows you to look at the different systems of the city which are floating over the city. I like to think that if you have a window that enables you to see the different layers on the air and that you can track and measure we can see even the position of the constellations in the sky on this very day and second on this moment of the year and the satellites around and the concentration of a zone in the atmosphere and the suspended particles and the velocity of the wind and the type of wind and all these layers, using all the, these layers, we use real-time data to take stories from the city. This viewpoint wants to be a machine that shows the dance, the choreography of the city on a daily basis. So being a mirror and seeing that the, over this decade where we have to change cities, we can reflect this transformation in, in this element. We can see it reflected here. The first phase, you have the direction of winds, and we also use traditional sentences related to the, um, the winds. We also speak about the pollution, but we also speak about biology, about the name of spora and pollen concentrated in the air. We can also speak about the trace of satellites, because over the past 40 years, we have created many satellites that are feeding us with information and that we can integrate here. And I also wanted to say that I did want to finish with this idea that the city ends by the sea, because we lead the cities by the sea, and we are a co-dependent with the sea at many levels from this, an historical point of view, as it is the connection to the world, but also the sea, it is the place where 25% of the CO2 uh, is absorbed, and whenever Whenever there is more CO2, the, the temperature of the sea is higher. And if this happens, uh, the sea level rises, and we have problems to reach this status quo. We obtained data from, we scanned the, the, the bottom of the sea to see how it is. We are not used to seeing this picture. And we also have data uh, taken from the port with the height of the waves and with their different progression. Things are not very concerning with this changing sea so far. Uh, the sea is renegotiating its barriers with us, and we cannot really oppose to the sea. We need to adapt to it over the next 30 years and to learn to coexist together. Another project in the viewpoint is this piece. Uh, uh, created with Joan Seyes, who is a paper sculpture, and he created this beast um, book with all the non-human neighbors of the city. 
all these creatures that are citizens as we are, and we are entangled with them. Sometimes we are coexist in a positive way, as it is the case with trees that provide us with oxygen and which generate shadow to us, and also with the banana trees that produce pollen, and there are many people who are allergic to this pollen. And there are also the stories of coexistence, of friction uh, between many species which depend on us, as it is the case of wars against uh, gulls and pigeons. The, these battles take place on the on the street every day. It is the first time that I have said pigeons in my speech. I will repeat it more. And we also imagine this project as a, a bell tower, as an observatory. Sometimes it is a microscope, sometimes it's a, a macroscope, sometimes it is a weather wane, sometimes it is an observatory, sometimes we look at things from a very close perspective and sometimes we see what is happened with us over time. And this piece is integrated in AI. Uh, I do not have sound, just wait a minute. Perfect. It's 1034 in Barcelona. This piece is called Ritmos, and through a narration with an AI voice, it speaks about that very day, that very moment. It speaks about uh, it is this time in Barcelona, it is this day at the end of this season or something, and it speaks about things, about the underground, about what's going on, about the direction of the wind at that moment, and it also speaks about how the winds move suspended particles uh, through the different streets of the city, and hence some streets are more polluted than others, depending on the type of wind at that very moment. All these resources were related to finding the, the tools to consider multiple scales, to have superpowers, to have many senses, enable, enabling us to know the whole city, to know everything around us using different tools. Because one of the problems is that, that we really need new things for our imagination in the, this here and now, in this Anthropocene, in this capital Sen, uh, as you may call it. We cannot tell about our current stories just speaking about uh, the interaction of technologies, human on human processes at a planet scale. We are in this theater play, and the scenography of the play is increasingly more important because it has revealed. And this is why we think we need to create new narratives for the Anthropocene, new dramaturgies. We need to find new ways to incorporate the stakeholders and actors of this this historical moment. This is one of the most complex projects I have been involved. It was um, launched in Manchester in 2019 in the EV Art Biennale. It is a collaboration with Rafael Lozano, one of the um, a great technological artists. It is called Atmospheric Memory. And it really speaks about how we are rewriting some of the stories of our time, understanding where we come from and how the processes that are going on today are located in, in frameworks of time that are much bigger. This part has some dramaturgy, some exhibitions, some immersive spaces. It took place in a very special building 
which is one of the most important uh, building in our city, is the, this, the, this is the Museum of uh, Industrial Sciences of Manchester. It speaks about the memories of the Industrial Revolution, but it, it was also two of the uh, one of the two ma first train extension of the of the story. It was the first train line connecting Manchester and Liverpool, and this connection, train connection was justified by the need to accelerate the process of the Industrial Revolution, and it was inhabited by the capacity to feed the steam engine with carbon. And I think this is the zero, the moment, the very first moment that ended 150 years ago with this atmosphere full of CO2, with temperatures increasing uh, comparing to that very, that moment and ahead of us. We are facing a really a breakdown at a global scale, so something very important started at this point. And here you are saying uh, something that uh, an object that the Science Museum of London lent to us. And I am very interested about this. It is a piece of the differential engine of Charles Babbitt. It is the first prototype of a computer. It is part of the central processor of the computer. And if you see it, here there is a small uh, tab with four digits. It is the first monitor of the story. You can see the calculations, the figures there. And this uh, differential engine was uh, created thanks to the steam engine, and here a process started, and it brings us to the current day with this relationship with the atmosphere that would have completely changed it and that we have filled with words and messages. The idea was to explore and, and he was saying that if we had a, a very large computer, we could calculate this. Every time that one of us speak, we are moving the air particles in front of us, and we disorganize these particles. And if we had a very large computer, we would be able to calculate the pathway of all these particles going back through to the, the moment before and to reconstruct everything that has been said. Davis said that the atmosphere was a very large library containing everything that has been said. And if we could uh, reshape the atmosphere, we could reconstruct everything that has been said by any person in the history. So the proposal of this project was to try to uh, generate, to, to create this Davies uh, dream to reconstruct, to rebuild the words coming out of our mouths. It was interesting. Uh, uh, it was it was a utopia for Babbage, and it was an, a dystopia for us. So we created this theater of atmosphere, which you are seeing now. It was a large. Um, building created with containers of 40 meters by 13 meters. We called it the atmosphere chamber. It was a kind of theater containing all the experiments with different interactive in, uh, interactive actions, videos, uh, historical artifacts. And we wanted to look at everything hidden in the atmosphere, all the sounds and the memories that could be uh, could help us to accomplish Babbage dreams. The first artwork was a corridor, a 40 meter corridor with four, four containers long. And in the ceiling there were more than 2,000 loudspeakers. And each loudspeaker 
generated, emulated the history of sound since the beginning of time. So as you walked over the corridor, you could see how the loudspeaker illuminated and, and there was a sound. The first meters, you could have the sounds of the tectonic plates and, and volcanoes on Earth. Then you have the first sounds of nature. We use the, the archive of the BBC that enabled us to have all the different sounds over these 40 meters. We could listen to four, uh, more, over 400 birds. Then we had the sounds of the industrialization and of the modern world. Bernie Krauser called it the anthropophonies. The sound of the, the sound of humans have changed the sounds of the world. But if you walk really fast, you could experiment it as a wave because you listen to many sounds for the first time, and we only have this experience with the white sound of a wave generating many particles being impacted at the same time. When each of the lights is on, it's because the loudspeaker is sounding, and even if you cannot see it here, each sound is different. Each sound is part of this mosaic of, of atmosphere sounds. Another piece of this project is, cl is this cloud display. You are seeing thousands of uh, water vaporizers. You can say a word, and there is this translation um, program that recognizes texts, and you can see how this word is written on the air. It is written in the atmosphere because the system listens to your voice and understands what you are saying. It identifies your word. And if you are curious, this matrix is made with these vaporizers of domestic. Um, uh, it is done with this domestic air fresheners uh, technology. This is the interior of the chamber. We wanted to create uh, this atmosphere theater. And at a certain moment, there was this cycle of one hour, and we produced a cloud that was all over the space. And we had this performance generating presence of a cloud. And if you think that this is like a Hazer steam uh, in the in the clubs scenarios, this is not like this. It is more like. Uh, Water, it is more like going through a cloud. One of the things that we discovered when we were researching about this project is that this Babbage utopia, the possibility to take a word out of the atmosphere, has become a kind of uh, totalitarian dystopia. If you have Amazon Echo or a smartphone and you use a system like Siri, if you use a voice assistant, we are going through an agreement, through a negotiation. We have included systems that are listening to us all the time and that are trying to understand what we say. And many of our words are stored to generate other systems. So when you say water, when you say uh, many people the same water with many different accents and many uh, at a different pace, it can be detected by the system as just one single world. And it also used to feed AI systems, used to uh, create system to interpret the world in a different way. So Babbage dreams saying that everything leaves a trace is becoming a power structure. It is generating knowledge. It is creating a world architecture. 
and many of the common actions like asking Alexa for the time, it, it is leaving a, a footprint uh, that will be there forever as part of this collective memory. When you go out of this uh, chamber, you could see this screen representing all the people that have been through the space classifying them based on uh, similar characteristics, reminded us that we are currently under surveillance and we are currently being classified. And this is one of the actual things that are going on today. And if this project had some Sin sinister or aspects, some, some apocalyptic aspect. This other project is very empowering, very releasing, considering uh, new technological problems, uh, but which are giving to us a new way to tell things. One of my obsessions was to imagine current technology, the way we are using these technologies are impacting our world. This is not only defined by technology or manufacturers, it is also a cultural movement. And cultural adapts technology and spreads its possibilities, defining its fields. And it is better to co-participate and to co-guide this uh, imagination, this search space with technologies, uh, rather than to have a, an apocalyptic perspective, thinking that we do not have any power on it and being just a subject and a victim instead of a, an agent. I have worked with artists and with uh, contemporary technologies to expand this vocabulary and to think how we can else understand our relationship with uh, technology. This project was presented in the 2021 Sonar Festival edition. I have been working in this festival for many Years, and it was part of a European project the, uh, for digital music. We work with an artist that I love, who is the American singer Holly Herdon and Matt Dreyhus. Holly Herdon is known because she is one of the most important singers in the indie industry. She has worked with uh, artificial AI voice, uh, AI and AI voice to generate new ways to relate with music, generating synthetic voices, spreading even different shapes to the capacity of human voices or collaborating uh, with artificial voices, enabling each si every singer to sing with non-human voices. With this relationship with non-human voices, including other species and these digital um, voices, I think that it was very important, interesting to work with Holly Herzog to understand how we generate these new things. And over the two years of, of the pandemic, Holly Herdon and Matt Dreithus developed uh, this project called Holly Plus in order to generate a vo an AI's voice model which was an exact clone of Holly's voice so that any computer could sing with her voice. And over 2021, we studied how to implement this project and how it would change things in a music festival and different things went on. They got in touch with Voktolab, which is a pioneer company in AI applied to music, which became very important in the peculiar market of virtual anime singers in Japan, the first virtual idol, which are non-human idols, generated digitally, but who has personality and a voice, and they are new idols in the Europe for the Japanese culture. And, and they had generated many synthetic voices with these new uh, pop idols 
and Holly Herdon and Matt Dreichert, uh, ask them to generate a system on real time, allowing anybody to sing with Holly's voice so that Holly could say, I will not sing anymore, as anybody could uh, already sing with my voice. So we tried to implement it. We were working a lot for one week, and they worked a lot over the summer. And this is the first demonstration of uh, Matt Dreichholz, who is singing on real time. And he has his vo a voice, which is not his, but of the woman who is next to him. Y yo me hace parar el altavoz. Y yo me hace parar el altavoz. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. La voz femenina va con un poquito por detrás que la masculina. The voice is, is, there is a, a bit of a decalage, but anyway, we wanted to work with singers that are not from this vocal tradition and to expand it to sing different singers that could use this instrument. And over the past year, I developed many projects with a Catalan singer, Maria Arnal, and I asked Maria and Tartarelena to make this experiment to generate a concert where they will not only work with their voices but also with Holly's voice. And this is what we got. This is a, a song of Maria. She sang her, boy, her song and it was sent to the AI system and the, the song is sung by Holly's voices. Uh, one thing, Holly does not speak Spanish, so the AI has a really strong English accent. And then and Holly is not, uh, has not Spanish tradition, uh, he does not sing with the Spanish tradition, so uh, this is also weird when you see this with AI. So this is Maria, who starts singing with her voice. Maria started to sing with her voice, and then the AI continues with Holly's voices. Insisto que no hay ninguna persona cantando. Este es el no body singing. This is the AI system. La semana pasada. Last week, uh, and this is a validation of this project. The European Union gave the Star Award to this project to acknowledge the projects that are using art to increase the capacities of current technologies. So those who have, uh, in ways that nobody had ever this uh, think thought about, I wanted to show you some other projects. And not the, one of the partners of creatures, if the super flags uh, design a study, and I could work with them several times. And this is one of the projects that, for me, uh, is one of the very most interesting ones for me. Culture is a lab to imagine new ways to live, because the way we live today is not written on a stone. 
It is determined by radical changes over history. And these are contingent changes. They could be of different ways. I always think about this story that many of us do not know, which is that the idea of sleeping eight hours at night is not biology. It is a cultural construction. We had never slept like this. There were times in history where people slept just four or five hours, and they just stayed in bed reading or praying, and then they slept a bit more. Many of the realities of our current world should not may not be the way they are because we have a really strong capacity to change things. And one of the possibilities is to create artifacts, to create mirrors to narrate how could history differ if we change some aspects. This project was conducted in the Contemporary Culture Center in Barcelona in 2017. It is about the scenarios uh, post climate change, imagining how the world would be uh, if we meet the, the um, different commitments of the Paris Agreement. As or if we do not. And this project was about a very specific situation, about how extreme climate event may generate food, a lack of food safety. The way we eat, we have normalized things that are not normal at all at any time of the day, at any, during any day of the year in a city like ours. You do not have to walk more than 300 meters to find a, a tomato. This is an unprecedented situation. 30 years ago, it was unthinkable. But this uh, reality cannot be taken for granted because we can move through a world where this is not real anymore and where there is not food safety anymore because we are not able to stop these disruptive um, impacts of climate change and we have to change our lifestyle. So we wanted to speak about the world, and we wanted to build a complete whole house showing this situation. It is a flat located in a concrete year where we cannot take for granted that we can meet all the food needs. Sometimes we need to develop a larger autonomy network. So the exhibition, there is a closed door that you open, and when you open it, you go into a space where you are in a story, where you are the main character. The project started in a kitchen. Everything was about acknowledging this world we were living in. Uh, radio show lasting 15 minutes, newspapers, recipe books. One of them is called um, Pets Are Proteins. And this kind of all kind of artifacts and recipes acknowledging that we can't not ignore anymore that we need to generate a self-sufficiency food safety um, network and it was about creating a farm to produce vegetables at home through a technology uh, called food ponic which is the combination of water atomizers through this to use the water through these pipes regulating temperature in the different lamps to provide plants with the necessary light and heat to generate food at home. This is not utopia. It was a challenge. We wanted to maintain this farm alive over six months, trying to acknowledge that this could actually happen, and it was not easy at all. Some things were possible, some things were not. Some things could be negotiated, others could not. The project had some 
alternative proposals, but there were also failures, and it was the spirit of the project. We didn't want to offer solutions, but to try to uh, implement the type of factors and situations that we may try to need, we may need to incorporate, and we can, as we cannot take them for granted anymore. We also need to consider all the lives that we have to consider, and we have lo lost a lot of knowledge about this. We also, it was also about fostering co-responsibility commit mechanisms, how do we create device that enable us to generate new negotiations where we are actors and the main characters, but also we also depend from these negotiations. We can define the elements of our destiny and we should also be active negotia negotiators. This is the most recent project. It was one month ago in Barcelona uh, with the City Council. It was the first edition of Model Festival in Barcelona on architecture. I curated it with other colleagues. And we do it in order to initiate the pathway to 2026 when Barcelona will be the world capital of architecture. And we wanted to create ephemeral um, devices within the street, within the real life without a spectate, without a audience, but with citizens. We were telling citizens, this is a new element on the street. You have to negotiate with it. You can approach it. You can go away. And this is one of the most interesting spaces of the city for me. This is the San Antonio platform. It is in a space where over more than 10 years, there was a temporary uh, market while some uh, works were being conducted in the actual market. Now the place is empty. And we just have the asphalt of where cars used to be. And it reminds us that there used to be traffic there, but now there is nothing. There is a gap there. And there are problems in the neighborhood. And some neighbors were asking, were discussing what to do here. And some neighbors were proposing to open into the traffic again. And if the, that happened, it would create a precedent. It would happen something that had never happened before, to give back a, a space for pedestrians, to give it back to, to cars. So there was a very strong discussion. And then we got it for the festival. We got this space for the festival. And we created a garden a mobile garden that could move over the 100 meters of this square. The, it, the weight was eight tons. It has different dozens of species selected based on different criteria, like a species for the future, which absorbed CO2. And the citizens could inhabit this space. It was a prototype of a renaturalization process, a way to rapidly uh, say that this street could be different. But the most important aspect of this project for me was that the garden could be moved, and citizens were the ones to move it. And over the 10 days of the, of the festival, we decided that there was a moment when it was necessary to move it that, so that different neighbors could have it next to their doors. And the ceremony to move the garden, 29 persons were necessary to move it. And it was a real party for the citizens. We thought we had to generate teams or a mechanism, but then we realized that we just had to tell the people, could you help us to move it? And just people would come and help us to move these eight tons. 
allá arriba que allá abajo. This was, if this garden belongs to citizens, they could be responsible to take care of it, and they could be responsible to negotiate things about it, about where to locate it, how to make it part of their neighborhood. It has been one of the most interesting experiences for me lately. We could have it free, it was not closed, because if you work with local politics, you know that the streets are hyper-regulated, it is very difficult to do things because there are many different regulations to say what to do and what not to do. And then we could do this, we could have eight tons of plants over this area without any limitation. In many occasions, I think about how do things come up? How do ideas and processes come up? And not very long ago, over the past year, I had some encounters that made me think about the story that I wanted to tell you today. And it is just the beginning. It is just a draft, maybe within some years it is a new project, but not now. But I wanted to think aloud with you about this. Donna Haraway, the philosopher, speaks about creatures defining other uh, beings in the world that interact with us. It would be bichos, uh, bugs in Spanish. Uh, in, in thinking about encounters with uh, bugs, with creatures, uh, speaking about bugs, I uh, over the past year I had these two encounters with uh, creatures with uh, bugs in my city. One is related to this project of the architectural festival when the town city council had allowed us to choose spaces. The most symbolic place for me was uh, Catalonia Square. You may know it if you have been to Barcelona. It is the center of the city. It is a crossroads. It is a public space belonging to everybody that has been there. It is like Plaza Nueva in Sevilla. And it is a space where everybody has memories, but nobody feels they belong to it because it is not related to a community, but to everybody. And it is not related to a story, but to uh, the official things. So I thought it was a nexus. It was a crossroads of cultures. We always thought, think about cross cultures, but then I had this idea. I said, it is not true that uh, this square does not belong to anybody. It is not a place that you just go through it and you don't stop there. There is somebody who's always there. There is somebody who belongs to this space as we feel we belong to other spaces. And these are pigeons. Catalonia Square is the main uh, square for pigeons, and it was the case uh, at Plaza de America in Sevilla or Trafalgar Square in London. There are always places which are linked to pigeons. And I remember to speak up with curators and with the city council. I, we should do something about pigeons. We should acknowledge the existence of pigeons as citizens. And the, the answer was uh, skeptical. They were kind of uncomfortable, but they were acknowledging this. It was a delicate situation. And it got my attention. Why are pigeons a delicate issue? And speaking about it, I realized that there were many aspects related to pigeons. Not everybody likes pigeons. There are people who really dislike them. And this coexistence is tolerated, but not celebrated. 
Secondly, for a public administration managing a city, currently pigeons are a synonym of problems. And I was surprised about this because I've been 20 years in Barcelona and I have seen pigeons there every day in Barcelona Square. They are uh, the witnesses of all the different concentrations and demonstrations over the different events that have happened, happened in Spain, in Barcelona. And it was interesting for me. It was difficult to speak about pigeons. It was difficult to speak about the needs and the likes of pigeons, about what they are to decide. So we did not speak about pigeons, but we did this project on uh, called Urban Cuisine. We created a great kitchen in the, in the center of the city. It was because cuisine um, and intertwines cultures uh, uh, and helps the coexistence of neighbors. It lasted for four days. It was a beautiful project. It was designed by Mayo, and pigeons were still there. But it was a project about cuisine where pigeons are. So we had to expel pigeons out with technologies, with infrasounds that scare them. So this negotiating process with pigeon uh, we told them, you do not have the right to negotiate with us. You will be out of your home for four days, and we are generating conditions that are very unpleasant for you. And we will be working with food, but you will not have access to the food. It was a violence act against uh, pigeons, but reality is full of violence. Violence is not punctual, and there is also negotiation. In cities, if you want something, somebody will not have this thing. If you want to, uh, one, if you want silence, if you want to walk on the street, or if you want to have common spaces, there are always conflicts in cities. And it is not possible to have a city without conflicts. But then I thought about pigeons in Catalonia Square and, and their architecture because they have turned into uh, decorating uh, elements, same as columns or sculptures. If you see the large dynamics of pigeons flying, you see them as a structure. They are as real as the, as the soil and they are also entertaining. They are there because people like going, they like feeding them. And when we are children and children feed pigeons, so they are in a zoo, which is the city. They depend on us. And if they are not entertaining animals, are they neighbors? And if they are neighbors, do they, do they have right and rights and which rights? Do they have the same rights as dogs and as cats, as horses, or as rats, or as ticks? Where are they? And finally, in seeing the different reactions, are they a plague? Are they an invasive species that we should control for the sake of our safety and security and convenience? These are not easy questions. I think it is worth to think about it. As citizens, we are always surrounded by pigeons. This venue is full of pigeons, and they are not here because we are here, even if we can still see some of them. Every human in this room is not alone. We are in coexistence, and pigeons are one of the most intimate partners of human lives. The history of humans and pigeons is the history of, uh, of two species coexisting together. Are, as Donna Hathaway says, we have been living together for thousands of years, discovering new ways to create symbiotic relations, discovering that our 
capacities and their capacities can be beneficial for each other and that we need each other in different ways. Living in a city is sometimes ignoring what is around us, not knowing what's going on with our neighbors. We live next to somebody that we do not know. This is why I thought that maybe we are surrounded by these beings and we do not know anything about them. And then I discovered that I am 47 years old, I have always lived in cities, and I didn't know much about pigeons. I didn't know, I didn't know why they are here. Where, where do they come from, why we reject them, why we act, why we have this idea about them. So this was a starting point for me to start working. First of all, there is not one thing as pigeons. Things are more complex. This is Columba, Libya which is the originator wild pigeon and all the the pigeons come from from this pigeon this is the rock dove all the pigeons that we are seeing today are the results of the continuous irritation of pigeons by humans there are over 300 varieties of uh, pigeons coming from Columba, Libya. And Columba, Libya hardly exists because this wild pigeon has always been crossed with pigeons that left us. And I will tell about this later on. This is the natural state of pigeons. And Darwin, in The Origin of a Species, uses the pigeons as an example about how natural selection can generate different varieties. Darwin deems uh, the pigeons to be the, the initiation of the uh, origin of a species. And it speaks about how a species can evolve over time. And where do pigeons come from? Their natural habitats are cliffs where they feel safe and they have the capacity to escape from predators. Originally, pigeons lived in cliffs and they felt protected there and they could uh, look for, for food from atop. But as cities started to appear, next to cliffs, they moved away. And pigeons realized that their natural habitat uh, was complemented by this new habitat, which was also perfect for them. They like hard surfaces. They like cement. They like marble. And they like tectonic uh, structures. They like a stone. They know how to nest in these places, and they can use it as a natural habitat and as a place to live. So pigeons were lo love asphalt and concrete and stone. And when we invented cities, we were also invented a new habitat for pigeons. So we can say that pigeons also belong to the first citizens. Pigeons in cities are, are as old as cities. But we discovered pigeons first. We brought pigeons with us. This is an installation that I really liked. We could, it could be seen in the last Venice Biennale on architecture. It is a collection of um, pigeon houses because we first uh, when humans started to create spaces to live for other species, they started to create spaces for pigeons. It is not clear when the first pigeons were tamed, but we have information from Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago. And in, in Egypt, we also have information our lives as humans start with the invention of, uh, of agriculture 
2,000 years ago, and since then we have been coexisting with pigeons. And 3,000 years ago, we learned that pigeons were used to send messages. They were the first uh, tool to send messages. In Rome, they used it to announce who, ha won who had won the Olympics. Genghis Khan has a network of pigeons to have males within Asia and Eastern Europe, enabling him to have this notion of empire. If he hadn't had pigeons, he wouldn't have this notion of empire. And pigeon, they deserve their own architecture, columbari, columbaris. They have thousands of years, like the one you can see here from Turkey. And why did we have to build houses for pigeons? Because we needed them to mail, to eat them, because they were a source of food, and for agriculture, because we used them uh, to we used them as a fertilizer for ag uh, agriculture. It was a main element for our evolution. And they were also used as a pet because they were intelligent animals. And they could be uh, used as bed and as livestock. It sounds weird now, but it was the case. And there was a close relationship between humans and pigeons, which are date back to ancient time. In France, uh, the, the king provided the Columba uh, benefit, and it was for novel, for uh, high-grade citizens, they could exploit um, pigeons, they had this right, and not everybody had the right to exploit pigeons. And there is a different differentiating aspect for pigeons. We look at them as rats nowadays, but when humans and pigeons met, we tamed them as cats and we used them as cows. But we have forgotten about this. Contemporary pigeons are tamed pigeons that lost their usefulness and that recovered their freedom, but they were also wild. They came back to nature. They abandoned their status of domesticated species and came back to a wild species. As I was saying, this relationship was a convenience relationship, a coexistent relationship. The first uh, uh, photography instruments we had were designed to be taken by pigeons. They were just in the Second World War to learn about the strategic positioning of the enemy. The British Army had over 2,050 mailing pigeons to learn about the situation in the different fronts. Napoleon used pigeons to convey messages in the front in a systematic manner. And over the course of the human history, pigeons were used to convey information. Pigeons were the first internet the first way to uh, have rapid communications. There were even um, uh, famous uh, pigeons like Cherami, their friend, which saved the life of a lost battalion uh, during the Second World War. And this pigeon could come back to its original destiny because they have this homing instinct. They do not have the need of any tool. And even if it uh, it was sought, the, the pigeon went back home, saving the life of this battalion of over 300 persons. Something happened when we started not to look at pigeons, our companions that had allowed us to advance in many ways. This is a kind of joke. 
colombification. In the moment that we are speaking about decolonization, I am speaking about colombification, speaking about colon colonization and colomba colombification. At a certain point, uh, pigeons are not used for fertilization, for food, or for communication, so they are uh, left aside. Uh, to be uh, ornaments and for entertaining purposes. This is a, a Sp Plaza de España using AI, and I filled it with uh, pigeons. I generated these images with AI uh, with pigeons in Plaza de España. We all have an image like this one. We have always been a child meeting a pigeon. I ask a person, do you have a, a picture in, in Catalonia Square with a pigeon? I was not born in Catalonia, but any child from Catalonia has this image. And what we did was to turn the pigeon in a kind of symbol of nature, a symbol of the wild uh, that enabled to encounter uh, us with the other, with an unknown being. And we have this planet, uh, which is increasingly uh, the, the, there is an increasing number of, of people and of pigeons in the planet, and coexistence became uh, difficult. They were not used as, as food, as internet, as uh, anymore, and we started using them as entertaining. In the 60s, in New York, a politician started to call them rats with wings, and they thinking that pigeons are a plague, they are a human problem, bringing uh, safety issues. In New York, in the cities, the, the city was uh, very densely inhabited. There were many problems between, uh, between the habitants and the pigeons, and they are related to an outbreak of meningitis. And from this moment, they decide that it is necessary to control the uh, population of pigeons for uh, safety issues. And because the excrements of pigeons were damaging the different buildings, and this entailed a problem of a budgetary problem for authorities. So all authorities have this problem: what to do with pigeons, how to prevent uh, the in, an increasing number of the population of pigeons. And one of the way is to try to think that we have to eliminate them, to sacrifice pigeons. And this debate is going on in many cities. It is a complex discussion. And all politicians have to balance the different needs. When this discussion appears, this discussion appears in the 70s, in the 90s, when we ha have already acknowledged the right to exist of other species. It would have been very different if it had happened in the 40s. Even people who dislike pigeons know that killing pigeons is not a nice thing to do. They would rather avoid it, or maybe not. Because in this uh, newspaper of Seville, people are saying, some people are saying that uh, it is unavoidable, that you cannot do anything. And uh, most of the people were saying that it is, uh, we need to kill all pigeons ASAP. I hope it is, this uh, survey does not have a statistical value. Of course, it is easier to say to kill them all that, rather than to admit that this is a complex issue. But we do not know what to do with it. And I think 
that this is because we do not know much about how do pigeons see the world and how there are many different worlds and each species lives the world in a different way. Pigeons, if we knew how pigeons feel, we would know, we would have look at it differently. They live in couples, they take care of their children, and they protect the nest. They have this strong sense of uh, solidarity towards the eggs and both the mother and the father can breastfeed the, 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 the little birds. In 1995, this paper was published. It was an experiment showing that if you showed Van Gogh pictures and Monet pictures to uh, pigeons, they were able to distinguish them. I am not saying that they are experts in, in art, but that their cognitive capacities enabled them to uh, differentiate patterns. Some years ago, there was this experiment showing that pigeons were able to organize figures, uh, that they were able to correct grammar mistakes, that they were able to uh, detect the world very with V or B, they were able to differentiate the, the right uh, spelling of the world. They are not monkeys, they are not mammals, but they are intelligent. In 1919, a zoologist, the Thakob on Nilso, adapted Amwelt. Uh, this term says that each species perceives the world in a different way, and we will never know what being a bat is because they um, have different elements to learn about the reality. We also learned that pigeons can see ultraviolet light. We have three receptors for colors in our eyes, but pigeons have Five, and so their vision of reality is different to ours. They see a wider range of colors. If I use an AI, I use an AI to see the city with ultraviolet rays, and this is what I got. Maybe pigeons see it this way, we will never know. And we are starting to learn things about how uh, pigeons can go back home uh, flying over 1,000 kilometers. And it seems that they are able to read the magnetic fields of the Earth through the, because they have this material called mosmagnetite, which allow them to have magneto perception. They can also use the sun as a compass. They have this extra human capacity being able to find the way home. And existing as a pigeon means to exist as in a different position, in a sophisticated position that we may not want to understand because we would have this problem on how to approach our coexistence with this being who is sophisticated and who has different capacities. I said that this story started with a, an encounter with two creatures, and I wanted to speak about the second creature. This is May 2021. We were going out of the lockdown. It was a difficult and complicated moment. It was a traumatic moment. And I went on my bike at night, and I found this situation in, in Barcelona. There was the, this fire men, and there was a lot of people, and they were taking something out of a house. And I suspected it was a rescue operation of a seagull. 
which was trapped in a balcony. And this seagull was being acknowledged by everybody. Somebody decided that its life deserved the work of these firemen, and people were applauding. They were celebrating this situation. We were all in favor of the seagull. But the thing is that the seagull has nested in the balcony of a house. And during the pandemic, seagulls and pigeons had problems to, to find food. And seagulls can be very aggressive. So having a nest of a seagull in, in your house is not easy. So I was thinking that we were being romantic about the seagull. But at the same time, we were demonizing uh, pigeons. Uh, neighbors, sometimes they are very problematic neighbors, but it is also the case for pigeons, which are in Catalonia place not long ago, not far away. There is this book called Theopolis, which helped me to this. It is about uh, um, politics for animals, same that we uh, acknowledge that there are indigenous tribes that have to be acknowledged and protective. We have to acknowledge that we have these relationships with animals that belong to their own cultures, and that they are our neighbors, and that they are citizens, and that these, the pigeons do not know their lives outside our cities, and so we have obligations towards them. So living among pigeons, living with pigeons, is not something that can be changed. We just uh, have to think differently how to coexist with them. This will be always with us. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much to Themos 98 and everybody who has been in this project. Thanks for letting me think aloud. And thanks to Eva, who helps me to understand how we coexist with pigeons. Thank you very much.